very good question. I will give you a very personal answer. It started uh, with uh, nothing to do with interpretation, but with languages. I was uh, a teenager knowing girls in the place where I lived. Uh, they were foreigners they come in, in holiday from many countries, and they get really interested in this uh, uh, being different in some way. Um, different languages, and then I met the parents, uh, different cultures, and so on. So I get interested in this uh, in this uh, spectrum. And then at some point, I understood that I wanted to do uh, something in that area and make it uh, a profession. Imagine that I uh, actually wanted to become a translator, so a different profession again. This was my, my goal. Uh, then at the university, uh, I studied in Bologna, uh, translation and interpretation. Um, I was not very happy how translation was thought at that time. And it was not challenging enough uh, for me, uh, not because of the translation, which was my interest, but because, I don't know, I was not very aligned to the way they uh, taught translation, so I decided to move uh, to interpretation. That's how I uh, became then a conference interpreter. Uh, I worked as a conference interpreter and as a translator too for many years, actually. And as always happens, things happen uh, by themselves. I was uh, in Germany at the time and uh, uh, where I did uh, Erasmus, and a uh, um, professor of mine asked me if I was uh, able to, to teach a class, translation class, they were in need of somebody that could find anybody, so they came to me and said, yes, why not? That was not my intention to become a teacher or whatever, um, and I started to enjoy it, um, and after a while, I say I, I took more and more classes and uh, because I get bored uh, very quickly in my life, I started to say, okay, what can I do more than just teaching? So I uh, started to, to do some, uh, some research and so on. By the way, without having any research position, uh, just a teaching uh, position, even without any proper contract. It was just a, a, so short-term contracts and so on. And so I started and I enjoyed it uh, actually uh, very much. Uh, at the beginning, I was exploring different topics and then I found my uh, topic, uh, which was uh, uh, interpretation and technology and always had uh, some uh, connection with technology actually more than with languages because I'm not very uh, talented for languages uh, more for for technology so I uh, saw that there was a possibility to combine them and at that time I had actually no competencies in the technology uh, so it was more uh, exploration of the possibility of technology and then I started to work also uh, on the applied uh, technology in parallel to my uh, research activity which was okay more uh, theoretical and so um, and I started to become a coder or programmer I started to work on my first uh, project which is still alive uh, interpret bank and uh, uh, from there, I started collaboration here and there, and I get more and more drawn from uh, the technological part of uh, language processing. And one day, I uh, get a call from uh, my uh, from Kudo. Uh, they wanted to create something uh, inside uh, the uh, platform about technology, so a very applied use of technology in the interpreting area and I accepted uh, the uh, the uh, challenge and uh, here I am still now working on different projects uh, than the initial ones but still uh, enjoying and still learning a lot. Uh, the, the, the short answer to you uh, to your question is that I get bored very quickly by anything and I always need some change uh, in my life uh, also in my professional life so I uh, get all these uh, different opportunities. So I tend to say yes to challenges, and that's where I am now. I was 
really pleased to get the invitation to work uh, in the program committee for the gala conference. At the beginning, I'm honest with you, was a, I was a little bit uh, concerned because I come actually from academia, from a very different way to interact with the topic of translation interpretation. So I say, hmm, what's going to happen? But as I said, you, I told you before, I'm always open to, to challenges. They, they motivate me. And I was absolutely, I fell absolutely in love about this way, first of all, with the professionality of all people involved in the organization. Um, there was for me uh, an incredible uh, value. Uh, all the other uh, members uh, and so on. We had so interesting discussions and so on. But then I really liked this very pragmatical approach to the topic of language accessibility of business, the business side of uh, languages that was completely missed in my life as an academic before this. So it really enriched me with an experience that uh, literally changed my way to, to see and consider language as a business, as a profession and so on. It doesn't substitute what I had experienced before, but it's a big com com completion, complementation, how you say this in English. And my wish, would be that the two worlds that I also discovered that do not have so much in common, uh, academics and LSP and so on, would learn from each other much more. And it goes in both directions, probably more academic from LSP because all the people in LSP have been in academics in one way or the other. But it's not the case on the opposite. So fantastic. There are many projects. Uh, I, I'm uh, um, working uh, as a CTO, Chief uh, Technology Officer, so overseeing many aspects of uh, the uh, innovation. So what can be used inside a company from a technological point of view? And my still my main... Uh, focus uh, in the innovation area is uh, about machine interpretation. So I started uh, with the focus on uh, creating tools to support interpreters. And now I moved uh, into the automation of, uh, of uh, spoken language uh, translation to, to create accessibility uh, where human interpretation cannot be used and it's a big uh, area where interpreters are not used and this is uh, the focus in the team that I have there are many people engineers and so on and so on I um, focus more on the uh, proper application of what's going on in research and so on uh, to create a tool that's able to translate the best way possible today with the technology that we have now to translate a spoken uh, language. That's the main focus. This is a good question. Um, interpretation has not been in focus of technological change as much as translation. There are many reasons for these. Uh, first of all, the spoken language, uh, spoken languages even more complex than the written language, and written language is complex uh, uh, by, by, by itself. But there are more layer of complexity in uh, the spoken language, of course, on the one side. And the other side is really a business uh, problem, if you want. It's very sh small um, domain if you compare it with other domains, uh, like a written translation. Um, so there has not been so much interest in this in the past when i started everybody thought that i was uh, uh, just crazy in thinking that technology could help um, performing uh, delivering improving whatever uh, human interpretation now it's becoming more uh, obvious uh, because in every uh, profession you can see with hype uh, forget about the hype and so on but you can see uh, the potential of uh, using uh, uh, in 
augmentation uh, to, 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 to improve uh, delivery, to improve the business side, to improve uh, quality and so on. I think probably if I should, if I have to summarize the main benefits potential benefits that we can see in using technology in the domain of uh, spoken language translation or interpretation, I would say there are uh, probably four. One, the first one is the possibility to increase quality of the service. So the quality of the interpretation. Um, think about the knowledge management, um, or access to information, to information before or during interpretation. So everything that can put a professional in the position to augment his or her ability to deliver a good translation. Um, and this is possible with the tools or the technology we have now. Um, again, um, glossary management tools uh, and uh, AI to, to, to give you suggestions in real time so that uh, your maybe your numbers during a simultaneous interpretation, for example, are more precise, the terminology is more correct, and so on. And this has been proved by academics uh, that have done uh, experiments and so on, so that there is a potential to improve quality. And by the way, the improvement of quality, which is very important for interpreters nowadays, will become even more important the more AI will be around, the more machine interpretation will be around, and everybody will be pushed to increase the quality of the service they deliver. For many interpreters, the top-notch interpreters, they will not change very much. They are already doing this, but there is a big uh, pool of interpreters that will need uh, to increase our quality. So this is an aspect where, where I, I think, will deliver uh, something useful. The second one um, has to do with probably quality assurance. So checking the quality, this is a very new domain, but checking quality of interpretation and make sure that interpretation meets some standard of quality. Uh, there is a lot of research going on. I myself doing some research in this area, and this could help um, LSP um, providers and so on to have a continuous check of uh, of quality. And because quality will become even more important, also methods to assess uh, quality will become uh, important. It's a big challenge uh, because we know that especially in interpretation, quality is a very, um, it's very difficult to, to, um, to, to formalize what quality is. There is a lot of components that are very difficult to formalize, but uh, there is good indications that it's possible uh, together with uh, human judgment, of course, it's always important uh, to have uh, some information. This, especially for interpretation at scale, big companies, big uh, institutions uh, could be a good asset uh, for them uh, to apply uh, artificial intelligence. Um, the third is probably, especially for, of, of course, for uh, LSP is full automation. As I said before, machine interpreting is coming. There is no doubt about this and the quality will improve uh, very fast in the next uh, years. And machine interpretation can offer the possibility to, to extend uh, the range of uh, multilingual communication. So the offering of what LSP can offer to clients that are interested in extending uh, multilingual communication, thanks to the easiness of automation. Of course, at the moment and for the years to come, there is not an overlapping of or not a much overlapping of human interpretation and machine interpretation. They are two different uh, pair of shoes. They will serve different uh, uh, areas, different needs, and, and so on. Uh, we could talk just one hour about this, but it's very important to understand that for LSP, it opens a new market that it doesn't exist because Human interpretation is expensive, is cumbersome, and it's used by right 
in a top notch, so to say, uh, so to say uh, events, uh, situation where uh, responsibility, quality, and all the things that a human can offer are key. All the rest are not served. And this will open uh, AI uh, a, new, a new market, uh, in my opinion, for, for LSP. The fourth, and that an area where I'm not an expert in, is AI offers the possibility to optimize many processes, which has nothing to do with language itself, but the company is made out of processes. And also there, as in any other aspect of the professional life, there is a possibility to optimize uh, the processes. Of course, the challenge that um, LSP or even pro uh, professional have in this is that as I said before, the, 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 the domain is very small and it's sometimes easier for a uh, middle-sized LSP or whatever to do things manually because of the size of what they do. Uh, it's so small that it doesn't probably uh, justify the investment and all this uh, kind of stuff. But for big players, uh, of course, this optimization uh, possibility is important and should be used, by the way, I think. Yeah. Machine interpretation is even more complex than machine translation in the sense that the technologies that you can apply are very different. Also in machine translation, of course, but here it's the, 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 the range of technologies you can apply are much more different. And with that, also the requirements in terms of data. Machine interpretation is basically done in two ways. One is the uh, cascading system where you have different uh, systems doing different things one after the other. Think about speech recognition, machine translation, and text-to-speech is the most easy way on the one range. And on the other range, you have uh, direct speech to speech, which, by the way, is still experimental. Uh, so it's more a technological development than a technology which is aware to be used in real life. And the second area, this direct speech, requires more data from speech from one language and speech in another language, similar to machine translation some way aligned, and then you train uh, the direct uh, speech to translation engine. The first model, so the cascading model, doesn't require any specific data to interpretation. So you really have data for each step that you uh, want to accomplish. So there is no need for data. So there is the, the same amount of data that you need for speech recognition, to have a robust speech recognition, machine translation, and text to speech, which normally requires a bit less data than the others. When you go to the speech to speech, um, then you require proper, proper, proper data. And uh, um, they are normally trained at the moment with not with trans interpretation data, because there is not enough interpretation data, because there are uh, policies that prevent you to use uh, interpretation uh, data. So it's simply not a use case, uh, or it's a use case in some experiments that some company, some some company or academia, academics are, are doing. But it's not uh, the, the 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 scope. So what you normally do is to use general uh, data sets. Um, um, speech, web uh, books, uh, and, and so on, of audio, uh, to train models. But this is what is happening now. But the, the tendency is to go into a direction, uh, even for speech to speech, but, but we are talking about the future, not now, where you don't need translations per se, so interpretation in our case, which is not available, in, uh, in but you merge these abilities of language models to process audio from one language to another without 
having translations per se. This is the, the novelty uh, that we are seeing because otherwise it will not be possible to create direct, at least direct speech to speech translation because there is no enough data to train these kind of uh, models. So what, what, what we see in, in big companies doing where, where they have big uh, research projects is that they really take, for example, a corpus in one language a corpus in another language, just spoken. So there is no written uh, codification of this, maybe because the languages don't have also uh, a written form. And you put them uh, together and the machine starts to learn uh, patterns of translating one from one language uh, to the other. So what, what I'm trying to say is that at the moment, we need a lot of data. The lot of data are more for the cascading system and this is where production is going now because it's the only technology that can at the moment of speaking create uh, best results the tendency is to go with uh, speech to speech directly this will be the the, the the probably the technology of the future and the amount of data will uh, require will probably decrease otherwise it will not be possible to to create at all a system like this if a lsp wants to add an offering for speech translation um they have two possibilities they build their own technology but i can tell you at the moment it's very uh complex and cumbersome um, it will become easier and easier. That, that's, a, that's a good point to remember that all these technologies are becoming more and more accessible, the technology itself for everybody. But from having accessibility to a technology and creating a product that's really working, it's still and will be a different pair of shoes. So the thing that, uh, in my opinion, LSP should do is to have some expert in-house that can judge a couple of things. For example, who's the vendor, who's the quality, and they, can re they have the ability also to measure quality, to assess quality, and also to have this expertise, which is needed, but incoming because it's such a new technology, to give advice to the clients when to use AI, and when to use uh, humans. Um, it's very important for, for an LSP as a middleman, so to say, to be this filter uh, between uh, hype and reality. And because this is a reality is evolving, you really need an expert. So some, somebody knowing. Uh, how interpretation work, how, what are the challenges, what are the potential of AI and all this stuff. So I would invest in forming somebody in-house in uh, with this expertise. When you have this expertise, you can add value to this uh, technology because you can consult, your, you can give advices to your clients, you can um, give them the right information the right limitation of technology, and then you add value on top of the technology. This is, uh, I would say, um, what is needed. And it's not as difficult to reach uh, as, a, as, a, as a target. But because it's a new technology, there is not so much information. Okay, Academic, for example, has failed uh, interpretation studies and so on to be interested in this topic. So they have not produced anything at all that can guide uh, people about just the principles. Okay, the technology is evolving so fast that you don't need a report from academics. It will be old when it comes out. But the principles about how to judge potentials and limitations of applying this kind of technology. So there is nothing uh, out there or almost nothing and this needs to come and probably LSP are well advised to do uh, this kind of uh, thoughts of uh, reflection themselves. Academic will come, but as always, as often a bit too late. 
Yeah, AI and ethics is a very important topic. Every technology has risks and AI is not different. Even more than other technologies in the past, I think AI as a tool has a disruptive potential and disruption can be positive or negative again. So it's very important to reflect, to discuss um, how to use AI in the real world. Um, and this is what ethics uh, in AI is doing. Um, I'm a bit skeptical, if I have to be honest, about the narrative that we are building now around ethics, because it reminds me of what's happening on the other side, which is the hype uh, of AI. So there is undoubtedly a hype around AI, but at the same time, I see that ethics in AI is becoming an hype too, uh, maybe to counterbalance the hype in that direction. However, I don't find it it's a very good uh, development because we all know that industries and so on, they will create hype about everything because they need to sell something. Rational reflection about something should be grounded on rationality, on facts and so on. And ethics should be like this. It's been like this for many years. I've been engaging, I, I engage myself, myself with uh, AI for, for many years, and I have uh, a pool of writers, thinkers, and so on that I really like very much. They are the pre AI hype ethicians. I think about uh, Luciano Floridi, uh, philosophers philosopher in Oxford and Bologna, think about Paolo Benanti, um, expert in AI and ethic in AI, or even a professor of economics. I'm a very big fan of Suskin, for example, Daniel Suskin, talking about the effect of AI on the labor, labor market and so on. So there is a lot of good AI ethics going on but there is also a, little, a, lot, a lot of uh, uh, what they call AI ethic hype which is moved more by uh, political ideas than by the real need or desire to pursue uh, truth and understanding of this but I will say that um, we all know that AI is a tool. I'm not talking about artificial general intelligence, which is another big topic, but AI as a tool will have, has, and will have a big impact on the labor market, on uh, democracy, on many things. So it's absolutely important to have discussions about AI and how to govern AI, not how to oppose AI because it doesn't work like this, but how to govern AI. The other problem I see that governing AI or any other complex technology is very complex. And to do this, you need a lot of knowledge, um, which is not only technical knowledge. This is the basis. You need technical knowledge. You need to understand AI if you want to to try to, to regulate it, but you need knowledge in many other aspects of life, in economics, in philosophy, and so on. And there is a risk that we are regulating AI without this bag of knowledge. And this could have detrimental effects. So it, you're mo moved by a desire to do good, regulating AI, but the effect could be under certain circumstances, the opposite. Going back to interpretation, um, this, is, this applies also to the ethics of interpretation. So there would be, or, or of spoken language translation, there will be a need as soon as tomorrow to understand, as I said before, where to use AI, where to use humans, why, it makes a difference in one case why it is 
good to use it in another case and so on. Most of the things that we can think of now about this are very intuitive. I mean, if it's a very high stake uh, meeting, you would say, okay, um, then probably you would have a human professional interpreters. In another case, you can have a human non-professional interpreter in another case, which exists also. In another case, you can have uh, AI. All this framing, all this discussion is part of AI, uh, sorry, of uh, ethics. So what happens to society, to people, if you use AI uh, with them in, in a specific event, think about immigration, think about so many areas. To regulate this, and it will be probably needed to be regulated in some way, um, you need expertise about how AI of speech translation works, about all the implication and so on. And this is something that we need to develop very, very fast. Otherwise, we will go with narratives against other narratives, AI, narrative hype, against people that don't want AI because all narratives. We have to develop this knowledge and do it fast. The best place in theory to do it is university. The university uh, interpreting studies and so on should dedicate time uh, to, 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 to work on this. If it's happening, we will see. Well, there are developments coming in the language space, I would say in the spoken language space, um, the most relevant will be machine interpretation. So we've seen that we have uh, developed at Kudo the first simultaneous machine interpretation, which, is, which has been developed for real life use. I call it real life use because Machine interpretation research on this has been going on for many years, but has been relegated more in the labs and so on. Now we see that it's starting to become real. Um, what is important to understand is that AI will always have limitations when dealing with languages, as humans have limitations when dealing with, uh, with languages. But AI and humans process languages in a different way. And what we will see, I think, in the future is that the way that AIs will process languages, at least from the outside the box, so it doesn't care what's happening inside the box, but it's what's coming out of this box, will resemble more and more what uh, humans uh, do. So we see it already now, for example, in ChatGPT or these large language models, that there are some emergent abilities that were unconceivable until a few, say, years ago, months ago. So ability to um, infer meaning uh, at a very deep level from a surface, which is language, because we can agree or disagree, but I would say um, language models, large language models are not intelligent in the sense that we humans think about intelligence. So they are not intelligence in that sense, but they are still able to solve linguistic problems at a very deep level without this need of being intelligent. This ability with all the limitation they have, everybody is aware about all the limitations of language models, that they still hallucinate, that they have bias and all these kinds of stuff. It's obvious that they are there and need to be um, uh, controlled. But still, what's remarkable is that there is an ability to work on language at the level that, for example, uh, uh, neural machine translation is not able to do. And you see a lot of interest of the machine translation community or LSP to apply, to try to start to use it, this power 
of language, large language models to increase translation quality. And what does it mean to increase translation quality? Is to make it aware of the context, to make aware of uh, uh, subtle things, register and so on, in a way which is very general. So you don't have to train it for a specific purpose. You just have to change the way you interact with it to reach this. This will have a big impact on uh, uh, also speech translation. So Akudo, we have released, for example, version one, which is the first version which is available now. But in the lab, we are working on version three. Uh, so version two will come uh, in one month or something like this with improvements. And version three will contain also large language models as an added layer of making sense of what's happening in a specific meeting. And we see that the improvements are, are considerable. I'm not, not say huge, there are still limitations, but are huge. And this, we, and we are talking about products that have been in development for one year. So, and we are already in version three and so on. And I guess many other companies are moving in the same direction. So we need to be prepared to have tools that will have a quality that is similar in some way to human quality. From there, there is a lot of space for human to do work, even if AI will be as good, let's say in an hypothetical uh, case, even if the AI is as good as human, you will still have need for human to perform the same action because in many areas of our life, we will not trust any machine to do something. But our mindset should change and start to prepare ourselves about this possibility, which I don't think is remote, to have really I call it human-like translation or interpretation, which doesn't mean it's the same, but it has characteristics which are the same. So it's less stupid as it is now. Starting from there, changing our perspective um, will uh, create, I guess, the possibility to thrive in an age of AI, because on the one side, we will empower people that do not have the possibility to access things in a different language, because you cannot have an interpreter if I want to see a YouTube podcast, uh, which is in English, and I want to see it in Italian, because I'm not aware, I'm not knowledgeable enough to access at this podcast or think about many other more important things as podcasts. So it will, on the one side, do a, realize, at least in part, the goal of accessibility that we have been trying to achieve with human professionals. And on the other side, it will make professionals even more important in all those areas where we as a collectivity will say, okay, here I need a human with his ability to judge things, to do even errors, but human errors, and to correct them and, and all this uh, process. So in my opinion, there is a big opportunity, I'm not sure if it will happen, but a big opportunity to have a win-win situation where we have professionals being even more important in their professionality, and have accessibility for, for, for more or less everyone. There are many other things that we should discuss about this. There are many shortcomings, many dangers, many risks. But if you want, next interview, we can talk about this.